Hello and welcome to GameSack. A couple of years ago, I made a video about game franchises that made a poor jump to 3D. So I figured, why not make a video about game franchises that made a great jump to 3D? If you haven't figured it out, well, that's what this video is all about. Now, what is a good example of a 2D franchise that went 3D and did really good at it? Well, Super Mario 64 is a good one. Great 2D series and a fantastic first 3D entry. A lot of you would also say that The Legend of Zelda The Ocarina of Time is another great example of a very good first 3D game. Now I'm not going to cover those two in this episode because picking them almost seems too easy. I just wanted to give you an example of what the rest of this episode is going to be like. And I didn't want to get yelled at for not including them in this episode, so I figured I'd better show them in some capacity. Now I'll only consider the first 3D game in the mainline series of a franchise because if that wasn't good then the series had a poor or rocky jump to 3D. Anyway, let's get started. Let's start out with Metal Gear Solid from Konami, released first on the PlayStation in 1998. I'd say that most people have an idea of what this game is, or at least has heard of it. Of course, old school players will remember Metal Gear on the NES, which was released in late 1987 in Japan, in North America in 1988, and in Europe in 1989. This is a cool stealth action game where you need to be careful not to be seen if you can, otherwise you'll alert the enemy, which can cause you lots of trouble. It was a bit primitive, but definitely a fun and unique game for its time. The first Metal Gear, however, was actually released in mid-1987 for the MSX2 in Japan and Europe. This is where it all began, and once you play this, you'll realize that the NES game is really just a simplified version of this. In fact, the creator of this game, Hideo Kojima, didn't even work on the NES version. The premise remains the same, of course. Be stealthy, find weapons and ammo, and find items that'll let you pass through things like gas and the like. Oh, and find different keycards to gain access to more and more areas. In 1990, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake was released on the MSX2 only in Japan. This continued Snake's adventures and, once again, stealth is key. You can't just rush in and fight. Well, you can, but that's really not the best approach to playing these games. Still, most people in North America anyway were familiar with the NES Metal Gear. It even got its own sequel in 1990 called Snake's Revenge. While this certainly wasn't as good as the first game, the franchise as a whole remained well regarded even though it skipped the entire 16-bit generation of consoles. When Metal Gear Solid finally came out, everyone, including myself, was excited to try it. And I wasn't let down at all. This one serves as a sequel to the two games that were on the MSX. Konami and Hideo Kojima kept all of the stealth elements in the game, even expanding on them a bit. It's all still primarily played from an overhead view, though you can shift into first-person mode sometimes. You'll collect a ton of different weapons and items, even the cardboard box disguise from the original games. There are a lot of cutscenes in this one, sometimes it almost seems there's more storytelling than gameplay. Of course, that story can often seem a bit convoluted, but it's gripping either way. Hell, I know I was hooked till the very end. This really is one of the highlights of the 32-bit gaming era. Of course, it goes without saying that Metal Gear Solid became kind of a franchise unto itself, spawning four more mainline entries, all of which were very popular. Playing as Snake is extremely fun, and his personality really lends to that. That's also mainly why I refused to play Metal Gear Solid 2 once it changed over to Raiden. The audio in this game is excellent from beginning to end, with fun dialogue and perfect music. The graphics in this one look very pixelated and jaggy, though they still serve the game quite well. This is just how the first PlayStation is. This game also gives you a ton of different radio buddies. They want to talk to you all the time, and naturally they can see and hear everything that you can. Snake, I unlocked the cargo door for you. Thanks. Where are you? Where I can see ya. It works well here though, and I feel that this game helped popularize the radio buddy concept. It's just that most other games suck at implementing them. In 2004, this one was remade for the GameCube and titled Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. It adds some new cutscenes and new enemy AI. This version almost seems like an HD remake in comparison, even though it's not actually an HD. The camera system was made to act more like Metal Gear Solid 2, and the voices were all re-recorded with most of the same voice actors. This is such a great game that not only do I feel that it made the jump to 3D gracefully, but it absolutely surpassed the 2D games that preceded it. Most people will tell you that the series peaked with Metal Gear Solid 3, but if you can, at least play this one. I love to reload during a battle. Oh, 
into a well rich chamber. All right. I like Metroid from Nintendo is an amazing game on the NES. Exploring everywhere and getting power-ups is quite addictive. The franchise got even better, hell, way better with Super Metroid on the Super NES. This elevated everything and became one of the greatest games ever made, in my opinion. And I guess some people probably also enjoyed Metroid 2 on the Game Boy. I never really bothered with it. Still, this was an extremely popular series, one that Nintendo dared not touch during the Nintendo 64 days. Then, in 2002, we finally got Metroid Prime on the GameCube. Everyone was skeptical about this one. The skepticism was quite understandable, as not only was Nintendo not developing the game themselves, but they handed it off to a Western developer. Next, the decision was made to make the game entirely in first person, which is a far cry from its side-scrolling roots. Once people finally got to play the game, they discovered what we already know now, that the game is outstanding in its own right. Somehow, Retro Studios was able to make the Metroid formula work in first-person 3D. At first, it doesn't seem like it might because you already have all of your powers. One of the great things about the original games was finding all the new powers and using them to get to new areas. Well, that's here too, as once you get past the first area, you're stripped of most of your powers and have to find them all again. This one also adds the element of scanning, which most people either love or hate. Personally, I find it kind of addictive to scan everything that's scannable. Still, scanning is often necessary and it's a touch clunky, so I can see why others might be a bit annoyed with it. The controls take a bit of getting used to, as you can't aim up or down unless you hold in the R trigger. You do get used to the controls, and exploring the game becomes really fun. For the time, the visuals were outstanding, with a mostly 60 frames per second speed. The game oddly letterboxes itself when you're in morph ball mode, though. The sound in Dolby Pro Logic 2 is great with sound surrounding you in spots and good music here and there. So is this one better than the 2D games that preceded it? No, especially not Super Metroid. However, the jump to 3D was still a great one, giving fans an excellent game that was well made. Metroid Prime went on to become a series in its own right, and at the time I'm making this video, Metroid Prime 4 is in development and the release date still hasn't been announced. Gotta say, I am looking forward to it though. I'm in the beginning of 2023 here, so if you're watching this way in the future, drop a comment and let me know how it is. This next franchise pissed me off when it first went 3D because it kicked my ass really hard. But I eventually got used to it and learned to love it. Now, when I was recording the gameplay for this episode, I hadn't played it for a while, so you might see evidence of me sucking again. Anyway, let's get on with it. Here's Ninja Gaiden from Tecmo. This franchise got its start as a beat-em-up in the arcades back in 1988. It's pretty clunky, though it does have its fans. Can't say I'm one of them, though. However, the series really took off when it arrived on the Famicom also in 1988 and on the NES in 1989 in North America. The gameplay style was changed to a 2D action platformer and the franchise was all the better for it. You can collect different types of sub-weapons in addition to your primary sword attack. And let's not forget the sticking to vertical surfaces and climbing. There were a total of three of these games released on the platform and they all had a reputation for being very difficult. They were also known for their cinematic cutscenes, which was pretty rare back in those days, especially on an 8-bit cartridge. Lastly, they were known for having some pretty kickin' music. It wasn't until the fabled year of 2004 when Ninja Gaiden finally went 3D, and it only did so on the original Xbox console. This game was a huge success with both critics and players. Once again, the playstyle had changed as it made no attempt to bring the 2D gameplay into 3D. Instead, it was designed from the ground up to be an all-new 3D action title. The only thing Tecmo decided to keep was its penchant for being hard as hell. As with all games in the franchise up to this point, you control a ninja named Ryu Hayabusa. This is not a continuation of the storyline from the NES games, and its cutscenes aren't anywhere near as cinematic. It doesn't matter though, as the action is tight and very well refined. 
There are some simple puzzles to solve now, like collecting an item so that the statue gives you a key, and things of that nature. There's ninja magic here, as well as different weapons that you can use. There's also a store to buy things like life potions, arrows, other weapons, and what have you. The next year, Tecmo released Ninja Gaiden Black, also on the Xbox. This is the same game with a few small things added, as well as some rebalancing. Director Tomonobu Itagaki says that this is the final version of the game. This one's supposed to be even more difficult than the original release, but for some reason I find it easier. The graphics are incredible for the time, outpacing anything on the PlayStation 2 and besting most GameCube games. Since it was designed only for the Xbox, they could get away with catering to its strengths without having to worry about how certain scenes might play out when downported to other consoles. The music and sounds here are far more ambient in nature and can't really compete with the NES soundtracks, but what's here is appropriate. This one was later ported to the PlayStation 3 as Ninja Gaiden Sigma, where it's even easier, but the visuals have also been upgraded. This was the first time that Sony players were able to get a taste of the series. I mean, if they didn't also own an Xbox. The series would go on to produce a couple more mainline games. Ninja Gaiden really smashed into 3D in a fantastic way. This is OutRun from SEGA. OutRun began life in the arcades in 1986, and as you can see and probably already know yourself, it's a really fun racing game. You race against the clock and get to listen to a few great tunes along the way. You also get to choose your own stage as you go, adding to the replayability of the game. You want to see all the different tracks and conquer each of them, but you only need to beat 5 of the 15 stages to beat the game. This is obviously a classic, and pretty much everyone knows what this game is, and for good reason. Well, in 1989, OutRun smashed into 3D with OutRun 3D on the Master System. What a fantastic 3D game this is. Just grab your 3D glasses and... Oh, wait. This isn't what I mean by 3D. Well, in 2003, OutRun finally went 3D in the arcades with OutRun 2. It came home to the Xbox, and its update called 2006 Coast to Coast came to a lot of other platforms. And while this game may not technically be 3D, I think it counts as everything is built with polygons. There were other racing games I could have chosen, like maybe F-Zero, but I really wanted to make that OutRun 3D on the Master System joke. I think it was worth it. Also, this isn't the first time this franchise went 3D, again technically, but the first time was a low-budget remake of the first game on the PlayStation 2. This is an actual mainline release in the series. Anyway, this OutRun may be just as beloved as the original OutRun. Again, you can choose your way through 15 stages to see five slightly different endings. If you're playing the Coast to Coast version, then there's actually two groups of 15 stages for a total of 30 unique stages. This one adds the ability to drift, and you absolutely need to master it to get anywhere here. Fortunately, it's quite easy to do. Just let go of the acceleration, tap the brakes, and re-engage the acceleration. At least that's how I do it. This will let you take sharp corners at super speed. Coming out of a drift can be a bit more difficult occasionally, at least for me, as sometimes I tend to fishtail when I do, but you know, whatever. It's not enough for me to lose the race or dislike the game in any way. There are other game modes that I personally never play, like the heart attack mode that has you doing different and specific things to impress your woman. It adds some meat to the title if you want something else to do. Once again, the scenery is incredible and varied. Back when this came out, the visuals were absolutely mind-blowing. And you know what? They still look fantastic today. Sega went all in on the Ferrari license. You've got many different Ferraris to choose from. And if you see another Ferrari on the road, it's a rival whom you need to pass. The same three musical tunes return, and they've been rearranged and sound excellent. A few new tunes have been added as well, and a couple of them sound great, though I never cared for the ones with the singing. Overall, I don't think many people, if anyone, has negative things to say about this game. I'd certainly say that this was a successful jump to 3D. I just hope that Sega regains the Ferrari license at some point and gives us an excellent 4K HDR 120 frames per second version of the game. Or hell, maybe even an OutRun 3. I'm not sure how much I trust modern day Sega to handle that though.
All right, I got two more franchises to show you. Now this next one, I didn't start playing until part 3.5 maybe, or maybe it was 3.3 .3 because there was like another one before it finally went to part four. I don't know why they do that. Maybe they just didn't want to count too high too fast. I don't know. Hardly anyone ever talks about the first Grand Theft Auto game from Take-Two Interactive, shown here on the original PlayStation. And for damn good reason, this 1997 game is pure garbage. It takes place using an overhead perspective with fairly generic graphics. The DNA of the games that you'd eventually come to know and love is here, like stealing cars, running over civilians, and getting chased by the cops. The main issue here is that the control is about as far from intuitive as they could possibly make it. It uses weird tank controls and a button to make you walk forward and a different one to walk backwards. You get your mission from phones and then follow the arrow in one of the worst designed cities in a video game. You'll often find yourself trapped by buildings which are everywhere. Grand Theft Auto 2, known simply as GTA 2, kept the same formula. The controls here are slightly better now as the triangle button will steal the cars for you. Be careful though because sometimes you'll get ripped right back out of the car you just stole. Once again, you can feel the DNA of what the game would become, but it just seems so empty. Both of these games have a dedicated fart and burp button if that gives you any kind of clue of what these games are. These performed okay in regards to sales, enough to warrant sequels, but they were never anything more than a moderate success. The paradigm shift in the game design was needed, and the franchise got it in 2001 with Grand Theft Auto 3 on the PlayStation 2. Though the previous games were technically open world, this one really takes it to another level. You play as a recently escaped criminal who never talks. You do various criminal jobs for different people around Liberty City. To say that this world feels much more realistic than the previous two games is a massive understatement. The developers wanted a city that felt lived in, and for the time, I'd say they succeeded. Traffic is driving around like you'd see in any city, and people are even walking around going about their day. Hey, I remember this game back when it was called Shenmue! Yeah, kinda, but not really. Sure, the first two games had traffic and people wandering around as well, but here it's much more engaging. When you beat someone up for absolutely no reason, it actually feels like you're crippling them and severely altering their quality of life for the rest of their existence instead of watching some random, barely defined sprites from five miles above. Once again in this one, you can steal cars, run people over, and like I said, beat people up. You can even shoot them for no reason. Be careful though, because even a two-star wanted level is extremely tough to escape in this one. The design of the city is still odd, but at least now you have a mini-map to help you out. The visuals are pretty bleak as well, but I'll forgive it since this game is the first in the series to feature a 3D open world like this. Grand Theft Auto 3 came out a bit later on the Xbox console as well. Did you know that as the game was originally in development, Microsoft was offered exclusivity of this title? Well, they declined because of the subject matter and also because the first two entries weren't exactly chart toppers. Of course, this series would go on to become better and better and more and more popular with each subsequent release. In fact, at the time I'm making this video, Grand Theft Auto V is the second best-selling video game of all time, with 170 million copies sold. If you're watching this video way in the future from 2023, well, how does that statement hold up for you? Jumping into 3D really benefited this franchise, so much so that the first two games are painful to play in comparison. This franchise would be dead if it didn't jump into 3D. 24-7 dudes, non-stop rock here. Wave Race 64 is an incredible game for the Nintendo 64 from Nintendo themselves. But did you know that this isn't the first game in the franchise? I feel that most people are probably at least somewhat aware of the Game Boy version of Wave Race these days. It was developed by Pax Sofnica and published by Nintendo only in North America. Now I know some of you Europeans are getting ready to hammer on that keyboard right about now, but just hold up a couple of minutes, okay? Basically, it plays like most top-down racing games. You have tank control similar to the Micro Machines games. You also have a turbo boost that you can use to help you get ahead sometimes. There's really not a whole lot in the way of variety here since it's the Game Boy and everything looks mostly the same from stage to stage. But you still need to make sure you guide your jet ski through the buoys properly. There's no music during a race and the sound is rather grating.
The series went to 3D on the Nintendo 64 in 1996 as Wave Race 64, and it was one of the earlier titles for the console. Nintendo decided to develop this one themselves, and I'm glad that they did. It's also one of my favorites, if not my favorite game for the system. This one works so much better in 3D. First of all, you have really cool wave physics, which were absolutely mind-boggling at the time, and still look and feel great to this day. It's very rare when games have water physics this good, and only a handful of other games come close. You can really feel the wave effects on your jet ski as you control it. In fact, a version of this game was later released in Japan that used the rumble pack, which allowed you to feel it even more. As you race around the tracks, you need to make sure you travel on the correct side of each buoy. You need to be on the left of the yellow ones, and you need to pass the red ones on the right. Another thing that brings the energy level up is the great music and the excitable announcer. Games with high energy levels like this tend to be very enjoyable. This game was an instant hit. In fact, a few months after this one came out in Europe in 1997, Nintendo released the Game Boy version over there to grab a few extra bucks from the name alone. See, I didn't forget about you guys. And it's a really hard game to go back to after playing the Nintendo 64 game. A sequel called Wave Race Blue Storm would eventually be released on the GameCube at the console's launch in 2001. It's still a great game, but overall, I feel it's not quite as much of a classic as the Nintendo 64 version. <laughs> this is a favorite of many people, and personally, I'd rather play it than the likes of Jet Moto or Hydro Thunder, even though those are great games in their own right. I'm sad that we haven't seen an update to Wave Race in over 20 years now. What's up with that, seriously? Well, hopefully soon. There you go, franchises that all made an excellent jump to 3D. So, do you have any examples of other franchises that made a great jump to 3D? I mean, ones that aren't named Mario or Zelda? If so, let me know. If not, let me know anyway. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. Okay, commercial for Sega Genesis games, take one. With Felios, you can Felios some phallic objects. Felios. Cut, that's dumb, try another game. Do you dare to play Darius? Actually, I think the game is pronounced Darius. Try it again. Do you dar to play Darius? Cut, okay, that just might be too much for your brain. Let's move on. Sagaya because people don't know how to pronounce Darius. Yeah, okay, probably true, but let's just do a different game. Gain ground. You don't want to lose ground, do you? Gain ground. Wow, okay, let's try not to be too enthusiastic about it. Try again. Gain ground. You don't want to lose ground, do you? Gain ground. Ooh. Damn it, why me? Let's just move on. Tomula sort of baseball. If it's good enough for a dead man, it's good enough for you. Cut! That's extremely disrespectful! Oh, come on, what is he gonna do, decompose on me? Just try the next game, you moron! Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf. If it's good enough Cut. for a- No, don't even oh, go there, I on. love his tea, just no. Chi Chi's Pro Challenge Golf. If it's good enough for a dead man, it's good enough for you. Cut! Chi Chi is still alive, you moron! Oh, come on, he's like almost 90, is that really living? How dare you! I'm gonna come in there and kick the- you want a game that has a name that's every bit as generic as your life? Well, try Space Megaforce. Cut! That's not even a Genesis game. We're supposed to be doing Genesis games, you brain cell vacuum. Rambo 3. Ram your bow into some great action. No, no, no. Oh, come on. That's pretty good. How about I ram my fist into your stupid face? El Viento. Eso es lo que pasa cuando comes frijoles. Estupido idiota. Solo haz el trabajo correctamente. Estoy sorprendido de que tengas el poder cerebral para hablar. El burro sabe más que tú. Steel Talons. 
Better than paper mache talons, I guess. Cut! No! No! Why did I get this job? Who thought you would be a good person to talk about Genesis games? Can we just do one right? Gunstar Heroes. This is a fantastic run and gun game from Treasure. Oh, thank God. That was great. Keep it up and we can get through this. Okay, let's go. Pete Sampras Tennis. It's good enough for a dead man. It's good enough for you.